Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. I'm going to start this off in uh, just welcoming Brianna Noble to the podcast. Um, may have seen Brianna back in June on uh, horseback during the Black Lives Matter protest in Oakland. Um, I know that's where I saw you for the first time. And um, that photo for me, I think, changed the narrative of the entire movement, Brianna. I was I was sitting in my, um, I think I was sitting trying to work, but also paying attention to what the hell's going on uh, outside of my four walls. And I saw your picture just splash over my social media feed. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is, this is different. This is uh, a different movement to me. And I um, want to know your feelings going into that day and, and into that protest with your beautiful horse, Dapper Dan. Well, you know, um, I don't think that I was any different than any of the other protesters, honestly. Um, I think a lot of people were there because they felt strongly. And so that's exactly why I showed up because I felt strongly about the issue at hand. I mean, um, I grew up in downtown Oakland at Oakland School for the Arts for high school. And I just remembered my freshman year of high school and everything that was going on with Oscar Grant. And I was really down there for, for a lot of that, you know, and I'd thrown youth town halls and stuff where we talked about police brutality and everything. And as I sat there the night before the protest in bed with my husband, I went, oh crap, you know, like things are exactly the same as when I was a freshman in high school talking about this exact same issue. This is literally repeating over again. And so that's what really motivated me to to get up and do something, you know? And it just seems like nothing I had ever done in the past to try to influence um, and impact a positive change in my community had worked. I'm like, I did spoken word. I did, you know, um, putting on those sorts of youth town hall forms. Nothing worked. But um, I have this unique sort of platform to stand on, which is my use of horses. And one thing that I always sort of noticed is that wherever I would go with my horse, everybody's like, ah, black woman on a horse. Like what's, what's that about? <laughs> Especially because, um, you know, a lot of the, the animals that I sell are for urban in, environments, you know, so just to sort of put it in perspective, um, a lot of the different police uh, horses <laughs> through California actually, um, you know, have contacted me in, in, trying to purchase the animals that I have for sale um, because they are so good in these urban environments. So I thought, oh, okay, well, I bet I could give the camera something different to look at if I were to ride here. So though I did not take them to the actual protest, I chose to go a few hours before um, for my horse and my own safety. Right. Um, but I just thought, you know, I, it really ticks me off that the cameras tend to, to show the destruction and everything around this. And people get more angry about the destruction of property than the loss of a life. So I said, you know what? Maybe I can help to change that narrative a little bit. So they're not going to look at those smashed windows. They're going to say, hey, look, that was a random woman on a horse that was really pissed off about what was going on. And that's exactly what it did. But I just, I had absolutely no idea that it would get so broad spread and, and, and make as big of an impact as it did. Yeah, I, I love it. And and I think that it just added a new s sort of level of strength and empowerment, uh, like you said, because it's something that we don't see every day. And I think that that's a, a been a major positive of this movement is that it's opening people's eyes to just so many new possibilities and, and so many different ways to find strength. So, but I did notice there were a lot of judgments. Like, as you said, you train your horse, your horses, Dapper Dan especially was ready for this moment. Uh, but a lot of people are like, you're not supposed to bring horses to protests and things like that, but they know nothing about your past. So I, I would love to hear about your history with horses and what led you to that moment. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I, I always like to tell people that I don't actually 
advocate for bringing your horse to a protest. So as I said, the protest started, I think it was slated to start at about 8.30 or nine o'clock that night. And so I was there, I hauled into Lake Merritt and I mm. rode my horse over from Lake Merritt at about six o'clock that afternoon. So um, when I went, it actually was not a fairly large group of people. You know, um, it was a lot of families, people with children that were protesting that sort of thing. Um, so I did that because um, not only my safety, my my animal safety, but the public safety um, is at the forefront of my mind as well. Um, so in terms of what I do, you know, I make my living and profession um, uh, in the horse world. So it is not out of the realm of character for me to ride a horse down the street. So if um, any Oakland natives have seen us in the past, we actually walked the exact same route in the Black Joy Parade, which mm, was, right. you mm. know, uh, when you talk about it had probably, I mean, thousands of more people um, than, than anything like this, you know. So I train my animals specifically um, to be safe in these urban environments, you know. So um, I kind of have this unique niche and um, I, I train and sell horses so that they are safe to ride and that sort of thing. Um, so like I said, um, I have had a police departments throughout California contact me because they are always the people that are interested in purchasing ah my horses because they do the things that they are looking for. They were, they have possessed all of those traits that they are looking for, for horses to deal with crowd management and that sort of thing, which is why um, anybody that's seen any of the videos of, of what happened, you know, as I'm sort of um, walking, walking past this crowd of people and they're, they're following me, um, you'll see that we even had motorcycles. So uh, a motorcycle club came up and they're walking, you know, riding their bikes beside us. And even at one point, you know, one person stops in front and actually starts spinning and burning rubber in mm -hmm. front of my horse's face with black smoke and literally an entire crowd of people being like, what are you doing? Like, why? <laughs> like, <laughs> have, don't know horses are like why would you do something like that but um as you guys could see in the video my horse is calm cool and collected the entire time mm -hmm. um, so for me it it's also puts me in a very a, a really cool position to just know that all of the work and all of the time that I've spent with this animal enables him to um trust and understand in the situation that we're we're all okay there Okay. I, I have a, I have another background or question, but that that's interesting that police, police officers and um, departments contact you about horses. Does that ever open up a line of communication for you with them about talking about Black Lives Matter, police brutality? Is that even, I, I just thought that was very interesting. Um, generally, no, not on that front. I've never actually sold one of my horses to the police department just because uh, um, a lot of <laughs> a lot of times, a lot of the riders that I've seen, you know, the, the departments don't choose riders. They choose police officers and then train them as riders um, mm -hmm. to get through, you right. know, which is not exactly the situation um, I want one of my horses in. You know, it takes a lot of trust and, and to learn to ride and to ride properly. It's a process that's really a lifelong sort of thing for me. Um, so I've never actually made the decision to sell one of my horses to the police department, but I have, and I do connect with them on different ways. So my big sister, um, Brittany Noble is actually a police officer and she is a San Francisco police officer that oh. works predominantly wow. in Sunnydale district. Oh um, yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, lots of people have asked me like, oh, what does it feel like to be two sisters on two different sides of the issue? We're not on different sides of this issue at all except my pedestal is horses and the platform she chose to stand on is, is by policing her own community and, and working as a police officer. So we collaborate in many different ways um, to affect change in the community and to change um, perspe perspectives of um, some of the positive forms of policing that take place out there. So just even recently, um, we, we had a community block party um, sort of COVID situation, that deal that we did in, back in October where I collaborated with Open yeah. for the Arts in a sort of um, Wakanda themed um, you know, party. So we had this an entire production team from Oakland School for the Arts and these children designed and, um, you know, uh, put paint on the horses and did everything they needed mm -hmm. to do to turn us into like our own cool walking Wakanda tribe. And we walked through the Sunnydale like that and, and showed up to their, their block party. So we had an amazing time. Year prior to that, we, we rode as the headless horseman with pumpkins in our arms. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> We, I definitely bit am big on um, the cat collaboration for um, 
inspiring positivity and affecting change and however that may come up in any way, shape or form. Yeah. And your sister is the one who introduced you to horseback riding, correct? Yeah. Five. Yeah. So that comes a little bit full circle. I love that. Mm -hmm, For sure. You know, my sister worked for the horses and my parents didn't have money for childcare. So I just, I was her job. She's 10 years older than (laughs) me. And you know, she used to hate having to drag me around everywhere that she, she went during the summer times, but I used to love sitting in the back of the barn and I just thought it was the coolest thing. And I thought I want to do that too. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you talk often about how horses are a mirror reflection of ourselves and that's why, you know, there's such a great use for, for healing and therapy. So when you say Dapper Dan was, was calm, (laughs) cool, and collected at that protest, I mean, that's a mirror reflection of you, right? But that wasn't always the case. You, You talk about how hard it was to, to train him. So I'm curious uh, how long that process was from when you got him to, to what brought him to the horse that we, we saw that day. Yeah, it's definitely been an ongoing process. And I have to say um, Dapper has definitely been the hardest horse I have ever trained in my life. Um, he, he was definitely a, a project for sure. So I picked him up for about $500 and he was a problem child, which is why <laughs> He was so cheap. And, you know, I saw this beautiful horse and I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, steal of a deal. Like, oh man, I'm going to make him so nice. And, you know, I'm going to make a really nice horse out of him. I'm going to make a lot of money. And, and, and then it, and then it was about the first month in and I was like, oh, I made a mistake. Oh. <laughs> I, I like, my husband was like, get rid of him. He's destroying everything. Like, I mean, he wanted him gone, wanted nothing to do with him. And I was like, oh God, I can't. I lost all of my money. I'm not going to, you know, I had a huge bet bill in my first month having him. Like I, I just really thought that I made a bad decision and he was so bad that it was kind of one of those things where it's like either I keep him or I euthanize him. Mm. And yeah. um, it wasn't something that I was going to sell and see somebody get hurt with. Um, so I, I, I really did like his personality and I was like, Oh, you're a turd. But for some reason, I just want to plug your big old head. <laughs> so, so I decided to keep him and I've cried and I've bled and we've had some, some conversations together. Um, but it has been a really, a really unique opportunity to assess my skills as a trainer my patience. And um, it's allowed me to connect with also a lot of other trainers that I've had in my life where it's like, horses will teach you real quick. Every time you think you think you know something, they'll be like, ha, 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 let me let me show you. Let me show you. You know, so I definitely <laughs> had to pull on my research <laughs> for ideas and, and sort of training tips to get him past the point that he was at. And, you know, I want to say after about a year of having this horse, um, I really came to realize what a special animal I had on my hand, um, you know? And once he realized that he, you know, that I wasn't there to dominate him, that I was his partner um, and I was going to walk beside him, even though I'm on top of him, I walk beside him in life. He'll do anything for me. You know, that's a horse that is now, um, I use him to train other hard horses and he's a horse that has saved my life actually in multiple occasions. Um, and you know, I really, I really, we read each other very well and we, we trust each other. And that's a, something that we still tend to build on every single day. But I'd have to say about a year and a half into having this horse, I was like, yes, yes. (laughs) Wow. It was all worth it. I love you so much, you know? So Mm. he's definitely something that, that, um, I trust in a lot of different situations and I'm really thankful to have him. Hmm. Well, can you talk a little bit about um, Mulatto Meadows and um, what you do on a daily basis with with your horses and and working with children and and people in general? Yeah, so Mulatto Meadows, I have been running my own business since I was about 19 years old. And I am- Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. Yes, I definitely did have to learn that- um, you know, your time is just as important as money, you know? And so I, I sort of learned that when you find what you love to do and you just do your best in it and, you know, really, really try to give back all that you can, that's, that's how the world is going to be a better sort of place. And it makes you happy, you know, nobody wants to work in a meaningless nine to five for the rest of their lives. So once I, Mm -hmm. I really sort of made that jump from my job as a veterinary technician into saying, Hey, no, I'm going to, I'm going to follow my passion and things really just started to 
started to rev up from there. So um, a lot of what I normally do is, like I said, I, I cult start. So I made my living for years and going out and finding either wild horses, feral horses, or just, you know, things that nobody really wants, haven't been handled. And I turn them into horses like Dapper Dan, uh, where they're really, really useful animals. They can have, you know, a 20 year life with a family and I sell them and that's how I make my living. I've always taught on the side of that. Um, and, you know, I've always had this plan for our project that we call Humble. Um, and Humble is something that I did because there were no other really, there's not too many people that are in the equestrian sports that look like me. It's very expensive. If you're not a fluent, yes. you don't really have mm -hmm. access to it. So during the summertime, um, because I, I love kids so much, I always ran a for-profit summer camp and we'd have so much fun and do cowboy campouts and learn lots. And usually at the end of that summer camp, I will have accumulated enough money where I could use some of that money to give back. So my last session of the summer would be to work with another organization, bring in a group of kids into that country environment and really give them the same experience that those for-profit kids, um, you know, had. So um, Humble is something that I've, I've been working to build over the last couple of years. It's something that I really always funded out of my own pocket. And uh, when I had this, everything happened with the protest and I started to get all of this attention. But, I mean, overnight, I went from having like a thousand followers on Instagram to like over 30,000 <laughs> like literally in the span of like two days. So I was like, I don't know what's happening, but I need to do something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, anybody that really knows me knows that like, I'm not one of those people that really gets off to the attention and fame. If anything, I've kind of sort of always hated through my life that I was pretty because I didn't like the mm. attention that came with it. I wanted to be known as Brianna, the smart person, the good writer, not the first thing out your mouth is, wow, oh my God, you're so pretty. Like that shit is shallow as hell to me, you know? Yes. So um, mm -hmm. I thought, how can I take this attention? And I thought, ah, Ding, ding. Um, this attention can be put towards the work that I've done with these kids, you know, so this takes it from just a little project that I, I occasionally do when I have money to something that I can get funding for and make a sustainable program for my community that I can leave behind in life. So that's exactly what I did. I, I sort of got together this amazing team of volunteers. Um, and we just had pro bono stuff come out of the blue of like, yes, I want to help. Yes, I want to make this bigger. And it has just been this, this phenomenal experience. So now we are able to impact oh, so many kids and we're, we're literally just getting started. So we have about 22 kids on the ground now that are low income um, that mm -hmm. are coming through our, our program on a consistent basis. So they get horseback riding lessons, they learn horsemanship and everything. It's a great opportunity for the kids. Um, I also have a partnership with East Bay Agency for Children. Um, so they serve about 9,000 low income kids throughout oh, wow. East Bay. And what's um, really unique about them is all the kids are attached to caseworkers. So it allows us to actually create a study around all of this to create some values and metrics yes. going forward with funding and stuff because there's lots of studies out there that study horses with PTSD with mm -hmm. autism um, but we're looking to really form a unique sort of study surrounding all of this you know so um, we are doing some uh, unique programming with them that are, are really um, the last one that we did with them was actually a family affair so um, there's this huge breakdown of communication within the family structure partly due to Corona, you know, everybody's stuck in their houses mm. together and uh, the communication system is really breaking, breaking down. People are disrespecting each other. It can be mm -hmm. hard to exist with everyone. So we did this um, four workshop series where we had these families come in and we used horses as a medium to talk about nonverbal communication and really um, put a mirror up to these families and how they're treating each other and, and, and help change that. So we are on the ground doing a whole heck of a lot whole heck of a lot right now and I'm very excited about all of it wow that's I, I don't have anything to say about that because that's that's things <laughs> that you don't you don't hear about and you don't mm -hmm. think about especially with horses and and communication so I I love that Brianna um I have a silly question for you um okay good good let's laugh so <laughs> I I have a question as uh someone who tried to ride horses when Ange and I went <laughs> to Nepal uh we we are finishing a documentary we went to Nepal in the last few days of our hike in the in the Himalayas we had to get horses so um because it was tough on all of us just trying to hike for like 13 days straight so um do you have any advice on how to actually get on a horse um <laughs> grace gracefully 
Because I and did I not at all. I have a video I can send you that I <laughs> just kind of watch. That brings me joy. And it's just Aaron <laughs> trying to get on a horse. Like multiple times. Um, please send this video. Uh, I have to say. <laughs> I definitely me have swearing to say, a lot. Sorry. <laughs> you did really well if you didn't fall off the other side on your first attempt. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Great. So it's not as silly as you think if you didn't fall off the other side. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the stuff with horses, I always tell people, you know, horses are hard. You know, if it was easy, everybody would do it. You know, it really gives you a, a newfound respect when you're mm-hmm. dealing with, you know, a, between a thousand and, and 1800 pound animal, you know? Um, so honestly, on a serious note, just have a good riding instructor that's going to help you through it. And on a non-serious <laughs> note, learn to laugh at yourself because stuff happens. I even tell the kids out here, I say, hey, don't fall off because if you fall off, I will ask if you're okay first and then I will laugh at you. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, Miss Bree, Miss Bree, that's not real nice. And I'm like, eh, you got to learn how to laugh at yourself a little yes. bit. Yes. Stuff happens. Nice. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I, yeah, on that note, like, I, I love that you're, you're teaching kids and you have 22 kids right now. That's so, that's so impressive that you're able to maintain this even throughout what we're going through this year. So I, I was wondering if maybe your next step can be teaching adult podcasters how to have confidence and direction in life, because I know a couple that may need those <laughs> classes. You know, you're just, you are young, but you just have an old soul. You're yes. so wise. I just yes. like, can you teach, can you teach this? Does it rub off on others is there a master class that we can sign up for yeah I think we have something here yeah I I have a feeling if you ladies come out to the ranch I don't even know if we're going to be able to get on on the horses actually because I think me and you are just going to be like laughing like hell honestly I had one of those I had one of those moments the other day where we were doing something and one of these kids just made me laugh so hard I came about this close to getting like dumped off the front end of the horse you know so I, I have a feeling we're not going to get <laughs> work done if we get together, but I need that. Yeah. I need that healing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, some of that is a part of that is what all of this is about, you know, is you guys talk about, it's amazing that we're able to do this through Corona, but I, I just think this is what everyone needs right now because there's not any opportunities where you can socially distance, do something new and be out in an open environment. So that is literally the only reason why we've been able to thrive through all of this because we can socially distance. We're out mm-hmm. in the open air and out in nature, you know? So um, in the scheme of all things safe, we're pretty much, you know, one of the only activities, one of the only structured activities that can still um, do quite well through all of this. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm so happy for you, Brianna, and I'm so happy for Milano Meadows and for Humble. And can you tell everyone where they can find you and where they can donate to Humble? Yes, definitely. We take all kinds of donations here. We definitely have gotten the influx of volunteers. So I have to say we had like literally over like 800 vol- volunteer Wow. <laughs> Um, So we still do encourage people to go online and fill out, you know, our volunteer forms, but just know we're, we're a little, little bit flooded on that, that side of things. Um, Monetary wise, we can always use donations for these kids, you know, this, everybody and their funding and their donations are what makes this go around. So if you'd like to donate, um, you can visit our website at www.mulattomeadows.com slash humble. And you can find all the different ways that you can um, donate there. Uh, We also, um, this has really been made possible by different professionals that have come on board to help pro bono. So for instance, we had like one of the largest nonprofit law firms, like our first two weeks be like, we're going to donate our services to you pro bono to help get you started. Ah, yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's the kind yes. Of sort of thing. So if you have some of those higher level skills and you'd like to donate your time, you know, we are a rapidly growing. And when I say rapid, I'm rapidly growing organization and um, people with those, you know, MBA level skills, we can really use your help. So if you'd like to support in that way, shoot us an email with your skills and your bandwidth, you know, and there, there may be a, an opportunity for us to collaborate where you can really, really help impact change with us here. 
Well, wow. well, we just, we really appreciate you, Brianna. We, we look up to you literally when you're on a horse and also metaphorically, you know, and uh, <laughs> I'm I, yeah. six feet tall. So yeah, yeah. yeah. See that you'll probably look up to me. That way. <laughs> well, I, I hope the invite yeah. still stands, you know, when times are a little easier that we can come visit Mulatto Meadows and, and watch Aaron get on a horse. I mean, I hope that no, no, we, no, we can no, do that no. one day. Whoa, whoa, whoa there, Philly. Easy, calm down. You're getting on too. We're laughing at you. You ain't getting out of here. <laughs> No, I yeah, I mean, I'm ready. Yeah, okay. Well, this time I'll have the camera, so. <laughs> oh, don't worry. We'll have somebody there, all of us. And I have to say, I'm not, I'm not going to be out of it because once you get me laughing, I cannot control my body at all. <laughs> <laughs> the kids know that and they try to do silly things to make me laugh because it usually ends up me with me like oddly snorting or something like that. Or like, yes. I'm going to get halfway dumped. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I am okay. all for well, it, great. Lady. Well, I hope that we can see you in early 2021. So thank you so much for your time and uh, keep doing what you're doing, please. For sure. Thank you, ladies. Again, yeah, so you're, you're a hero. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> thank you. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show's edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions.